Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm going to start with an apology. I uh, misread the dates with respect to the submission of my conference paper, and as such, it's not included on your USB. If you do want to find a full copy of the paper, it's at that address. You can sort of read there, um, goo.gl forward slash CTFZ capital AW. So if you're interested in looking at the whole thing, that's where you can find it. Um, this paper uh, essentially follows up from a paper I presented uh, about a year ago at the Australian Association of Pure and Applied Ethics um, that dealt with the, the more, I guess, tedious in some senses ethical question about what actually is wrong with doping. And in particular, it uh, had a look at a debate that's gone on in the ethical literature as between, on the one hand, uh, second-generation utilitarian Julian Savalescu, and on the other hand, William Devine, who is a uh, natural law theorist slash virtue ethicist. Savalescu, in 2007, published a very controversial paper in the British Journal of Medical Medicine, arguing there is no inherent problem with doping. Um, and saying that um, the idea that we even need anti-doping regulation full stop is a silly idea. Um, what should we have instead is a, a focus on player safety. So he said, for example, rather than saying no one is to take androgen or testosterone, instead we should be saying no one is to have an unsafe level of testosterone in their bodies, TE ratio <coughs> over and above what we understand to be safe. So that was Savalescu's point, and Devine had a go at that argument in, in various ways, largely, I think, um, unsuccessfully, though I don't, I don't say, suggest that there isn't a successful argument against doping, I just don't think it's William Devine's. Um, that paper, as I say, was presented to a, uh, an audience of pure and applied ethicists, so, so quite a different audience. And it struck me when I was doing that paper that um, a lot of the legal issues flow on from that debate. Because essentially, um, and these are the three things I want to discuss relatively briefly, is um, we have a problem. Um, with respect to doping in sport is that if we can't identify how bad, how egregious a moral sin it is, we then are going to struggle to answer the question, well, should we make it a crime? So I'm going to look firstly about a general overview, um, and by necessity it has to be fairly high level because there's a lot written about this, um, but when should the legislature be intervening to make things a crime? Um, secondly, I'm going to ask, when is conduct in sport a moral problem as opposed to simply a problem of the rules of sport? And finally, I'm going to ask, well, aside from moral considerations, what practical difficulties, and I say quote-unquote practical difficulties, I mean practical legal difficulties, which are slightly a different thing, um, what arise from the criminalisation of paid use generally? And particularly, and it's going to seem like um, the WADA code is going to be the whipping boy of this conference, um, but particularly the difficulties that come from criminalising uh, doping under the WADA code, or essentially lending the force of the criminal law to the WADA code, which is what's been proposed in many areas. So, um, again, uh, I apologise to those of you who work in the area of legal or political philosophy because this is going to seem an appalling overgeneralisation. But um, essentially, when we ask what is the legitimate reach of the criminal law, we get two classes of answers. We get answers from the liberal theorists. Now, please don't think I'm talking about the Liberal Party here. It has nothing to do with the Liberal Party. Um, liberal theorists who say there are legitimate uh, limits on government's reach, whether you take that in a very extreme way that John Stuart Mill does with his harm principle, or in a much less extreme way that the um, contemporary liberals such as John Rawls do through the lens of, of rights and morality, um, there is nevertheless a sphere of private influence into which the government really shouldn't be bothering. Uh, and on the other hand, you have uh, conservatives um, who are of the view that there is no conduct that in theory the government can't touch but there may be practical issues that arise that stop the government from <coughs> legislating. Uh, Denise Myerson, I've got a quote up there from her, which I think summarises hundreds of years of political and legal philosophy 
quite succinctly. She says, essentially, um, the debate is there's not the issue that no one thinks we should enforce moral standards. Of course, everyone thinks the law has some role to play in enforcing moral standards, moral standards against murder, for example. Uh, the debate, rather, is between those who think that all of the majority's moral beliefs are, in principle, transferable into law, and those who think that only a subclass are. It's a debate between those who think there are theoretical limits to what we can criminalise and those who think there are only pragmatic limits. The Liberal position, as I've mentioned, is typified in its classical performance by the harm principle, John Stuart Mill, that is, unless you can cite a definite harm to society, and harm is used as a term of art by Mill, um, and it goes very, very far. When George Brandis, who was in the media a lot recently for other reasons, uh, stood up notoriously um, uh, 12 or so months ago and said, people have a right to be bigots, he literally cited John Stuart Mill's On Liberty as his philosophical authority for that proposition. So when we say harm in Mill's sense, now I think he's, he's misread Mill quite badly, but that's neither here nor there. When we say harm, we don't mean harm to society generally. Um, Mill was willing to countenance all sorts of nasty things that the government shouldn't involved in. As I say, contemporary formulations emphasise a person's rights, but nevertheless accept that there is a sphere of influence the government shouldn't basically be involved with. Uh, this, uh, I'm going to cite here the Wolfenden Report, um, quite famous in political philosophy. Um, it was a 1960. 19, late 1950s, 1960s era committee into the criminalisation of homosexuality and prostitution in the United Kingdom. And they, um, probably not surprisingly, given the intellectual pedigree of the United Kingdom Parliament and um, the, the influence of people like Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill on that Parliament, uh, the, the Parliament accepted this report in substance uh, and Lord Wolfenden in that said, unless a deliberate attempt is made by society acting through the agency of the law to equate the sphere of crime but that is sin, there must remain a realm of private morality and immorality which is in brief and crude terms not the law's business. So this poses the first problem, sorry, so alternatively Lord Devlin typifies the conservative approach in his text The Enforcement of Morals, um, however he, he identifies that while in theory we could punish anything, and he gives the example here for example of adultery, we all think adultery is a moral wrong. A liberal would very classically say, well, notwithstanding that it's a moral wrong, it's something that the state really has no business being involved in prosecuting people for. There are some states that do prosecute people for adultery. It's a very bad idea in practice, as you can no doubt imagine. And even the conservatives who say, well, look, in theory, there's nothing stopping the state from criminalising adultery, acknowledge that, well, there might be very significant practical difficulties that would test the capacity of our law forces, um, <coughs> as one can imagine quite readily. So the problem then is we've got to, if we want to um, have a good legal basis for criminalising doping, we've got to convince people either on the one hand that it is a significant moral problem or on the other hand, if we don't necessarily think we need to, we can say, well, we can criminalise it just because that's all what we can do, we need to show that there aren't significant practical difficulties that arise from the criminalisation. So let's start with the moral problem. Clearly, and we've identified a lot already, um, there's overlap um, between morality and sport and sport and the law. Uh, Barry Hall's punching Brent Staker behind play in 2008 was not just against the rules of the sport. It was also a deeply immoral thing for him to do. It was also probably a criminal thing for him to do, though he escaped prosecution in that case. Not in all cases. In Aaron Billinghurst, um, a seminal English case referenced in the paper, is um, authority for the proposition that if you go well beyond the rules of sport and punching someone behind play is quite clearly well beyond the rules of sport, the criminal law is more than happy to step in in those circumstances. The question, though, is can the moral consideration arise in the opposite direction? That is, rather than the law coming into the sport, can we draw out from the sport to the law, which is essentially what we're being asked to do when we ask to criminalise doping. Um, now, I want to identify here one particular species of crime and um, sport, and that is this issue of fraud, because many attempts to justify the criminalisation of doping in sports 
have proceeded on the basis that it is some kind of fraud offence. That is, you may well be getting some sort of pecuniary benefit for playing in this sport, and if you are cheating to gain that pecuniary benefit, then that looks something like fraud. Um, that, I think, is a, a very bad mischaracterization of the offence of fraud for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm going to point principally to um, Moylan and the State of Western Australia to show fraud at its widest. Fraud at its widest is understood as any pecuniary benefit you obtain by deception. Um, and in Moylan and the State of Western Australia, someone indicated to their boss, and this, I think, took a bit of gumption, that the board was deeply unhappy with them, um, that it was best if they resign, and they, if they did that, they could um, maintain some sort of dignity and a good reference going forward. Um, their boss did, in fact, resign, and they then applied for that position. It was sort of that sort of thing. Um, the court in Moylan determined that that was capable of being fraud. Um, contrast this with the position in the same year uh, of the State of Western Australia in Belitho, Belitho was one of these fascinating cases that arise um, in criminal law largely because people do extraordinarily stupid things. Um, and in Belitho, uh, a person who the evidence seemed to suggest had some sort of mental illness um, had posed as an orthopaedic surgeon and administered a series of injections uh, to the victim. Um, now, the court in that case was faced with a problem with respect to the nature of the consent that was obtained for the injections, but also with respect to this issue of fraud. A charge of criminal fraud was brought, and that was not successful, largely on the basis that no payment was offered for the objection. Now, I must say, that should really ring alarm bells. If <laughs> an orthopaedic surgeon isn't charging you through the nose, they're probably not an orthopaedic surgeon. But the, the, it, the court was very clear here. They said, fraud is not a general offence of dishonesty. Fraud is very specific and it relates to obtaining a very specific financial advantage that is not, on, I think on my view and I think a view generally, going to encompass cheating in sport because you get bonuses if you win or you're more likely to get um, uh, sponsorship, among other things. We then come to this question of, well, if doping is, if it isn't fraud is there nevertheless some sort of intense moral perversion inherent in doping that is enough to justify its criminalisation? And I ask, I think, a, a question we're all going to want to answer no to very quickly. Is dishonesty a natural part of sport? A very quick no answer, I think, is perhaps a naive answer because there are lots of instances in sport in which dishonesty is, if not... Uh, I guess, what we want players to be doing. It's what we accept that players do. The most egregious example of this kind of dishonesty in the play of sport was Diego Maradona's Hand of God goal in 1986. Many of you may be too young to remember it. Those not, no doubt, remember it quite well. Um, that, in, that was a semi-final in the World Cup against England. It was ultimately decisive in their 2-1 victory against England, um, where he quite deliberately handballed the goal well, into, into the goal. He gave a very famous press conference afterwards where he was sort of accused of having been done this, and he said, well, that goal was a little bit the hand of Maradona, a little bit the hand of God. But even more interesting than that kind of deception is the on-field deception he engaged in in order to have the goal counted. Soccer notoriously doesn't have a lot of video referees uh, and this sort of business. Um, so his teammates, uh, and this is really well accounted, I give uh, citations for it in the paper, um, weren't celebrating and so he ran around to them and said, because they all thought it would be waved off because it was quite clearly a handball, he ran around to them and said, come and hug me, otherwise they're not going to let this goal go through. And so they all sort of performed, knowing it was a handball, as though it wasn't. Now, that kind of deception comes up a lot. Now, quite notorious in that instance, but it's not outside the realm of sport. Now we might now lots of people don't like Diego Maradona for that very reason, but he was able to he was a hero to the Argentinians for many years, still is. Um, so can we pin doping on something even more than that? Because what the best you can say of the hand of God instance is well that's why we have referees and if the referees don't do their job correctly, 
we don't expect cricketers to walk if the referee does, if the umpire doesn't call them. So when there's something internal to the game of sport, um, we can solve the problem that way. That's why doping's much worse. And alternatively, the other view that can be taken, and I think this is probably puts the case for doping at its highest, is that um, doping cheats relevantly persons who are not doping. And um, our New Zealand friends no doubt will remember Valerie Adams um, and her very outspoken anger at uh, 2012 games in which uh, Nadezhda Ostapchuk, I'm probably mangling her name, um, was uh, suspected very strongly of Valerie Adams by being a drug cheat. Prior to the competition, she was very outspoken about her suspicions. Um, she then lost, uh, Valerie Adams lost, and it was later found out that, in fact, her suspicions were well-founded and Nadezda was, in fact, a drug cheat. She was stripped of the medal. They had a re-meddling ceremony in New Zealand, but ultimately it was a pretty hollow event as compared to the, the loss of a chance. Um, but... There are similar kinds of dishonesty in sport. That is, now I want to identify the key features here. Dishonesty that is premeditated, dishonesty that is deliberately intended to gain an advantage over your rivals, that, that hurts your rivals, in this case uh, pre prevents them from achieving the, the NRL equivalent of Olympic gold, that is a premiership, and that are not compensable within the rules of the game per se. So they're not a Diego Maradona handball. They're um, outside the scope of something a referee can do. And I think the quintessential example here is the Melbourne Storm salary cap. Um, it hits all of those things. They... Um, there was serious loss to athletes, financial advantage, deliberate and premeditated rule breaking was not remediable within the context of play. Um, but is that enough to criminalise the behaviour? This was referred to the Victorian police, who took one look at it and said, nah, there's nothing we're going to be doing about this. This really isn't the kind of thing we want to get involved with. Some people jumped up and down and said, oh, but they swore statutory declarations that... Um, uh, were false, and in fact they did. Uh, intriguingly, so far as I can tell, no one in this country has ever been prosecuted for uh, swearing a false statutory declaration, uh, except when in curial proceedings, that is, before courts. So this process by which people, for example, I've done it myself, have to sign statutory declarations saying that my CV is you know, representative of what I've actually done. No one's ever been prosecuted by that. There was a suggestion by Matt Wanchamp um, for Cycling Australia that we could use that mechanism to weed out drug cheats and to criminalise it by making everyone sign, I have not cheated in a stat deck, and we'll prosecute them afterwards for signing a false statutory declaration. I think very little will come of that, given the unwillingness for prosecution in those kinds of cases. The question then is, OK, if we can't build a sufficient moral case, what if we just ignore the moral issue, criminalise it anyway? I think significant uh, practical difficulties arise, and I'm going to pick on the governance of sports bill that's currently before the UK Parliament, um, and that would criminalise the taking of any substance on the WADA banned list by an athlete from the proposed bill. Um, athlete means any person who competes at any level in a sport under the jurisdiction of a governing body of sport, Governing body of sport is defined as any organisation that does one of essentially a category of things. First of all, you've got to receive money from the government directly or indirectly. I do not know of a sporting organisation in this or any other country that does not indirectly receive money from the government. Uh, in fact, it's impossible to be a sporting organisation in Australia and not receive some money from the government because... For other reasons, you have to have a governance body that is regulated in certain ways, you have to have a member's information protection mm -hmm. officer, you have to have all of these sorts of things that is impossible to do without deep interface with the government that would constitute an indirect financial benefit. So the question is, any athlete who competes under a sports organisation, well, that captures everyone. I mean, I've, I use the example in the paper of the West Australian Flying Bisque Association who, who do the sport of ultimate frisbee. Now, I don't want to say that's not a serious sport. No doubt there are serious athletes in there. But the idea that they would be prosecuted for breaches of the WADA code seems kind of strange. Um, similarly, uh, I myself am involved in wrestling. I'm a terrible wrestler, um, but I do, because there aren't a lot of wrestlers, get to attend uh, national events. Um, the Asada people wander around um, at that drug testing. Now, with respect to those weight categories that are being challenged for Olympic gold, for Olympic places, 
Absolutely, I think that's perfectly acceptable. But I also think there are a lot of very, not just amateur athletes, but, but what I'll call journeyman amateur athletes who have who are going to be caught up in this regulatory framework who we don't really intend. This, I think, poses two key problems. The first is a reputational problem, and I'm very interested in um, sort of Professor Gaufield's paper following up about the idea of social capital. I think we will erode our social capital in the seriousness of doping very, very quickly if we start prosecuting for doping very amateur athletes. Right now, if you go on the ASADA website and you see all the people that have been um, banned, the majority of them are bodybuilders. Now, some of them are quote-unquote natural bodybuilders. I'm not convinced that's actually a thing. Um, but the idea that these are the people who should be targeting for ASADA regime testing, let alone criminal regime testing, I think is a bit, a bit odd. Uh, the second difficulty is that the, the bill itself doesn't have a carve-out for TUE therapeutic use exemptions. So regardless of whether you are actually breaching the WADA code or not, the proposed law would capture you for a criminal offence. That seems pretty weird. Um, and similarly, there are a whole heap of substances on the WADA list that either aren't particularly efficacious with respect to being performance enhancing, masking agents, among other things, and alternatively have very good therapeutic uses. Oh, we've only got one limit this. Uh, I'll give the example here again because I'm in wrestling. We've got a lot of unruly young kids who get into wrestling because their parents think it's a good thing for them to get out aggression and discipline. Lots of those kids are on ADD medication, all of which is banned for in-competition use. Um, it would be a nightmare to try and uh, deal with that within the context of the WADA code. Um, and then finally, there's a flip side, which is that because we're talking the realm of law and not the realm of um, uh, the WADA code, there must be a mens rea component. The criminal law has never been willing to do, as the WADA does, quite reasonably, I think, with respect to its performance-enhancing drugs, say, look, if it goes in your body, that's it. The criminal law has always wanted some sort of guilty mind. So there's two carve-outs. There's a carve-out for... Uh, if you intentionally, you have to actually knowingly take the substance and it has to be with the intention of your performance. That is going to mean, in practice, that if we have this law on the books, as they're proposing to have in the UK, and then we apply that to the scenario we find in the Essendon case, not a single criminal prosecution would get up. Because every single one of those young men, most of them are quite young men, are going to say, well, I didn't knowingly take a prohibited substance. I was told it was not prohibited. Um, and I didn't have a specific intention of that prohibited substance affecting my performance in various ways. Proving that would become very, very difficult. So I have to, for time reasons, leave it there. But also, that's the end of the slide. So how convenient. Thank you very much.